jet tour that's kind of flown through this book. You know, it's only been probably about a year and a half, maybe two years. I'm trying to think of when we started. It's been a while. You know, man, Paul has, has just laid out just the doctrine of theology the, about Christ and everything and then how we should live and what we should do. And, man, it's just really been a good book. And I, um, we're, we're going to, we're going to see today, uh, as we're in the final verses here, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 27, um, is what we're going to what we're going to get through. That, that Paul is going to be talking to his to the church. And this is kind of like a that, that I think you really try to end it in chapter 15, but chapter 16 was just kind of like a PS. And we're going to look and see what he's trying to tell the church uh, here. These last few verses, so. If you will, please stand as I read Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 27. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learned and turned away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greet you. And so do Lucius and Jason. And Sosipater, my kinsman. I, Teridus, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, host of me. And to the whole church, greet you. Aristus, the city treasurer, greet you. And Quartus, his, the brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is unable to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Well, Heavenly Father, I'm just so in awe of everything you do in my life and in our lives. And God, I'm so thankful that you love me enough to send your son down to die for me. God, I pray as I go into this message that your word will be spoken and not mine. God, I pray that somehow I can just get out of your way. We can just paint a picture of your son. It's only through your strength that I'm able to do any of this. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. You know, we all know the date September 11th. It rings a, a, of a tragedy, and, and, and it, it'll live in infamy. We know that, that those two planes that crashed into the Twin Tower killed over 3,000 people. You know, and, and and we really every year just know the havoc and death that was on the U.S. that day. But we also know, maybe we don't realize that some of the people knew what was coming as far after the planes hit, and they called and left messages, final words to their family. A guy named Moses realized he was 29. He was the chief executive at the windows on the world atop the top of the North Tower, realizing that he was in imminent danger, he called and left a message for his wife who says, I love you. There was a lady named Melissa Harrington. She called to her brand new husband who was asleep in San Francisco and left a message, there's a lot of smoke. I just want to let you know that I love you. On that day, there was a lot who took the last opportunity to give their loved ones some final words. For remembrance. You know, we look at history that George Washington said right before he died, died I die hard and I'm ready to go. Woodrow Wilson said simply, I am ready when he was on his deathbed. What would be your last words? You know, what would you want to be, what would you want to say on your deathbed? There's very few people, I think, that realize that the words they are speaking are always going to be the last. You know, mm -hmm. we, look at, we look at this, and we see that Paul 
comes to the, to the extended part of his letter. His final words to the Romans. I think he possessed some type of spiritual insight into the troubles which really laid ahead for the Roman church. And I, well, in all churches. Because I think this, this letter might have been written to the Roman church, but it really impacts all the churches even today. I think here he attempts to get some thoughts which would help, which would protect, encourage, and remind the church of their task. And I think Paul found it very difficult to end this letter. As you see, once again, he, he, we're going to see that he thanks a, a lot of, of different people, even in this last part of it. Paul really, I think, thinks there's always more to be said. But he wants to let know this church about what's coming. About the evil, the influencers that, that are going to be coming into this church. He says, man, these people, they're coming in to, and they're going to damage the church. He, he, he wants the people to understand who they are and how it's going to cause a dissension in the church when they start teaching something else besides Jesus Christ is the only way. So we're going to see that after his final appear that he sends greetings from those who are in Corinth with him. And we're going to see how he blesses his reading with God's amazing grace. And so let's dig into these, this last few verses here in chapter 16. In verses 17 through 20. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause ascensions and hindrance, contrary to the teaching which you learn, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore I am rejoicing over you, but I want to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So Paul urges them to have nothing to do with people who are going to come into church, cause division, hostilities, and maybe hindrance to, to the church. He, he is saying you need to avoid these type of people. He is warning them to watch out for these spiritual enemies. He defines them as, as people who are divisive, people who seek to hinder the Lord's work. People who put obstacles in, in your way and are contrary to the teaching, what we have learned. And, and you know what? He says we are to keep away to avoid these people who call, cause dissensions in the church, in the fellowship, and to the teaching of the word. He says don't engage these false teachers. Don't spend time arguing with them. Mark them and avoid for them. Avoid them. You know what? That, that, little, that part does bring a little bit of truth. I, I believe that you cannot sit down with somebody who's not a believer, and argue with them the truth. Amen. I don't think you can persuade them by just sitting down and arguing with them. You know, you go, you know, we know like at the Kentucky State Fair, the atheists have a booth. And they're just waiting for you to walk by. And they're ready. And you cannot argue with them. You know, because they got all their facts and all the things in a row. And you're never, the only thing that, that would really change somebody's heart is God's word. Through prayer. You know, you can live a life to show them what you do. You can take people to scripture and show them scripture. But I, I, Paul is saying, don't sit there and argue. Don't even give these people a chance to speak any type of disunity that is different than Christ. Mark them. Go on. Leave them alone. Don't even engage is what Paul is saying. Because these type of people are not serving the Lord. They're not doing God's work. They are really just being disunified. They, they, they are, uh, are, are tearing apart those who have Jesus has united. They're serving their own selfish desires, he says. He, he says it's, it's their appetite. They're not, it, it's that they're not of Christ, but their own appetites. They, that, they, that they want their desires. They want their, they want to be promoted. They want to see their, they want to see their self being up there. They're, they're smooth of tongue. And, and they want to be, they want to be brought up to the front. They want everybody to, to put them on a pedestal. They're out for their own glory. They're not out for Christ's glory. They're not out for the church's glory. They're out for their own glory. They have selfish desires and motives. Such as anger, and pride, and jealousy. 
Paul says, don't be fooled by them. You know, I, I think that there's, there's a core group of people, Christians who, who study God's Word, who knows God's Word, they're not going to be fooled by the tickling of the ears. They're not going to be fooled by somebody stepping up and preaching something different or teaching something different. But you know what? There's a, there's a group of Christians that's on the outside that don't get into God's Word, that don't study God's Word. And they hear these half-truths. And they hear these things and they're, and, they're, and they're taken away because they're superficial in their learnings. They come to church. They might even sit through a Bible study, but they don't dig in. They don't, they don't grasp it. Let me tell you what, guys. Satan deals in half-truths. He is. If you, somebody came in and told you a bold-faced lie, you're going to shut them straight down. If somebody comes in and starts talking about half-truth, give you a little bit of scripture, and then they twist that scripture around, it's easy to be swayed unless you're into God's word. Mm -hmm. So you know, Paul says, beware of these people. They're coming in. You know? Paul is just reminding them, be careful of this. Understand this. And he says, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Paul, I don't want them to be naive. He just says, look, just be innocent of the evil. Understand that that evil is there. Just don't take any part of it. Be above reproach. Don't let that come into the church. Understand when that evil is there, you've got to be wise enough to know what's good. But when it comes to evil, you just need to kind of leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't, let, don't be part of it. You know? And then he says... God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace. Man, God is a God of peace, isn't he? Isn't that who he is? I mean, we, we are his enemies. We, we are always in battle with God before we know Christ. But he's a God of peace. He wants peace. And he's going to give you that peace. Peace when things happen. Peace when, 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 when we feel like there's, uh, the, there's trouble going on. There will never be, there will always be wars and stuff like that. But let me tell you what, he's going to give you a peace. Because in the end, we know that Christ is going to crush Satan's head. You want to go back to Genesis and read that? You can go back to um, Genesis 3, chapter 15, when, when it talks about the uh, Son of Man will crush the head of Satan. We know that that's going to happen. We know that in the end we're going to win. We know through Christ, because we get a peace through Christ, that, that that peace will transcend all the problems that we are having. So Paul says, remain innocent concerning evil. And watch how God will pour his peace into your life. And you will have a peace in your heart, a peace that will flow from your lips, a peace you will be seen on your face. God is able to give us a peace in the presence of, of adversaries that we face. The false teachers who cause dissension are under Satan's influence. But God establishes peace. And we know that in the end that Christ will crush Satan's head. We know that we win. And that's what he's trying to get at. So let, let's look at the next few verses. Um, 21 through 24. It says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so does Lucius and Jason. And so say Pater, my kinsman, I, Teratus, who write this letter, greet you in the, war, in the Lord. Gaius, host to me, and to the whole church, greet you. Aristus, the city treasurer, greet you. As Cortus, my brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So we see that, that Paul sends a greetings from all the people who are around him. I, I figure out this is the group of people that kind of separates from that list that we had last week. I think it, this, this group of people is a group of, uh, of men, of kinsmen, fellow countrymen, brothers in, in Christ, people who, um, who have, Paul has, been, has made a spiritual brother, not a, not a not, not a regular brother, but a spiritual brother. I see these people here, you know, and, and he talks about Timothy first. Timothy was such a key in the growth of that early church. I mean, we, we see that he traveled with Paul uh, on missionary journeys and that, that Paul wrote letters to him as he worked to strengthen the churches in Ephesus. And we see that Timothy was really a main figure in the New Testament churches being being expanded, uh, keeping them sound and all that. And we see these other people and they all have different different parts. I, I believe that they, 
Uh, these men were really something to, to him. Um, you know, Gaius was a pastor. I believe he was a pastor of a home church there in Corinth. I, I think that he was a, a, a foundation of that early church. Um, it says that he hosted me in the whole church. That's what he talked to him about. Um, Aristotle was, was a city treasurer. He, he was a... Uh, so he was probably somebody high up in prominence. You know, and we see these men. And Paul says they send greetings to you. I think these were Paul's inner circle right there when he was in Corinth with these men. And then he, in verse 24... It's kind of a, a piece of benediction in verse 20. Um, you know, usually Paul said, the grace of God and the peace of Christ will, will be with you. But here he, he comes out and, and, he, and he says, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Some, some Bibles, you're not going to see that in there. Um, in the Greek manuscript, it must not, some of it wasn't there. Um, but it, it's there now. And it talks about grace. Man. This was Paul's distinctive closing when he talks about that grace. You know what? Apart from grace, we have nothing. Nothing at all. Amen. Paul knew that. And he tells the Roman church how grace of God is with you. Man is undeserved freely given by God. And I believe there's no part of the Christian experience that's possible without grace. Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We look at the finish it up in verses 25 through 27. So now to him is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. But now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. So we Paul has really laid the gospel out here in the book of Romans. Man, he he has he has shown it without a shadow of a doubt that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. He is the great high priest. And nothing, nothing. Nobody can ever get to God except through him. There's nothing that you can do. Nothing is good enough. You can't give enough money. You can't spend enough time. You can't do enough things. It's only through Christ. He has laid that out. You know, the prophets of the Old Testament, I believe we're not fully aware of the meaning of their own words. They, they <laughs> were at God's command about the fulfillment of the mystery, the coming of the Messiah, the salvation of the Gentiles, and the returning of the Jews. You see, now, now after the coming of the Christ, the church is being set up, and they are, are finally starting to realize the mysteries of the Old Testament and, and showing them, how they showed that the Messiah was coming to be our Savior. And the churches no longer are in that mystery. They start understanding that Christ is our Savior. He is the only way. And, and, and so that mystery... <coughs> It's no longer a secret. And God showed a way of saving the Gentiles. And it's becoming known throughout the world. God's glory and ultimate purpose is displayed through Christ. You know, and we are called to an obedient faith because of that. We are called to be obedient to Christ, to live as Christ wants us to live, and have that faith of knowing that he went to the cross for our, for our sins. Man, he had not been to Rome yet to meet all the Christians there, but he was, he was joyous after hearing about how faithful they were. And I, I believe we can easily count ourselves among those strangers to whom he was writing. And I believe that because of that, Paul has called us to a unity. Not, not to worry about things in our life. To be encouraging, not to be worldly. And to seek God. I believe that, that we belong to churches that need to listen carefully to what Paul is saying and apply a teaching about unity, about service, 
without love in our life. Any effort in that direction, I, doesn't, I, I do not think that brings glory to God. And I think that that's what we need to do. I got three points that I want to talk about. And I think that the church really needs. I think that Paul really points out. As, as a church, we need to watch out for the world. We need to watch out for the world. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Man, John is just black and white. He just flat out tells you. If you love anything in the world, then the Father is not in you. There is a line that is drawn that says, either in the world or you're in Christ. It's one or the other. John tells us to say no to the world. That there is a need for us to understand the world system. I believe that, but we need to stand opposite of the world. We need to be different than the world. We, we cannot be worldly people. We need to reject all that is in the world so the love of God may flow through us. You know? Really, and I don't want to just keep throwing out the word worldliness or, or the world without really giving a definition to it. You know? It is anything that displeases God, that opposes His teaching, is under Satan's dominion, such as philosophies, ideals, doctrines that distort or degrade Christ and His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. To me, anything that's in the place of God is worldliness. Anything that you put above Him is worldliness. That includes your church, your family, your work, hobbies, anything that you put in front of God is worldliness. There's no place for it. Paul, Paul talks about it all the time. It's a command of scripture not to be in the world. You can't <laughs> serve two masters. That's the bottom line. You can't do it. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, you know this, it says no one can serve two masters. For either you will take, you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And, and, I, and I'm taking wealth, I'm going to say the world. You cannot serve God and the world. You cannot serve two masters. Jesus said you're going to love one and hate the other. There's no way you can do that. There's no way you can put God first in your life and make the world important in your life. It just does not work out that way. You can't serve two masters. I believe the way that we can make sure we don't do that is that we have to do is, is seek Christ. Colossians 3 1 tells us, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You know, we 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 it's imperative that we set our hearts on the things above. You know, it, it, is, it, it is to set our minds on things above of not earthly. This really translates, keep on thinking as a matter of habit on things above, not on the things of earth. You know, I, I really think that's, that, is the, that is the truth. If we don't want to serve the world or be in the world, then we need to keep our eyes on Christ. Amen. I think it's human nature to keep our, our eyes and our hearts in the world. I think that is, that, that, that is, that is easy to do in our human nature. You know, we are sinful. That's that's what it is. It's hard to keep our, our hearts and minds set on things above because the world keeps telling us to, to keep our hearts and minds here. Man, I think, it, I think it requires a tenacious effort on our part because we tend to look down by nature. As a church, we cannot allow worldly things in it. We need to stand opposed to things. Now, I'm not saying that we are to hate the things. Let me tell you what. If it's, Scripture says it's not right, that it's wrong, then we as a church cannot let that in our church. We cannot let those things come into our church. We love on people. We point them to Christ. We show them the way. 
not hate them, but we can't let them, we can't let that into our church and preach something different that is not in Scripture. So really, the first thing in the church, we need to watch out for the world, make sure it does not come in to our churches. Way too many times it, it does infiltrate our churches. Second thing I want us to see, as a church, we need to encourage. We need to encourage. Man, there's a man that's in the New Testament who had a particular <coughs> for encouragement. His parents named him Joseph. But the early leaders of the church called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Can you imagine? Man, how, how would that make you feel if the leaders of the church called you a Barnabas? Say, you know what? I, I've seen you in action. You're not, you're not Joseph. You're, you're Barnabas. I've seen you come alongside people. I've seen you give people second chances. I've seen you encourage people when they were down. You're, you're, we're going to start calling you Barnabas. Can you imagine how that felt him when the leaders of the church, the, the apostles, came up to him and said, man, you're an encourager. That's who you are. And I'll tell you what, we need a lot of Barnabases in our churches. Amen. We need to be Barnabas. We need to be encouraging in our churches. This is not a place to come and tear people down. It's a, come, it's a place to lift people up. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you also, you also, so, should, so also should you. So we, we need to understand that we need to be an encourager. It means to come alongside us. We need to put encourage in perspective or an attitude that helps others and, and, and get up and, and get going again. It is, it is recharging somebody who is down and out. It is being that way to help people. Man, there's a lot of things in our life that, that really discourages us. You know, we, we sometimes... There's a crisis, or sometimes we're just exhausted, or, or a sickness, or, or maybe there's a cutting more from somebody else, and, and it really brings us down. Satan really wants to take that time to separate you and say, well, look at this. Why do you want to be part of that church? Look at what they're doing. There's nobody there who cares. That's the farthest from the truth. You know, we need to spot people who are in times of need, and we need to be encouragers. You know what? I believe the church has to be a place of encouragement. I believe the church has to be a place where we can come together to be a safe place that is full of love and not tear each other down. As a church, we need to be a group of encouragers. Last thing I want us to see, as a church, we need to seek God. Amen. We need to seek God. D.L. Moody said, we ought to seek the face of God every morning before we seek the face of man. J. Vernon McGee says, feeling better has become more important to us than finding God, programs, and answers for all the problems. And all that is more important today than seeking God. Amen. A.W. Tozer says, if we yearn after God, even as much as a cow yearns for her calf, we would be worshiping and effective believers. God wants us to be. If we long for God as a bride looks forward to the return of her husband, we will be a far greater force for God than we are now. We are told in 2 Chronicles, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn to their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and I will fill their land. So what is your ambition in life? To get rich, make a name for yourself, and do something wonderful for God. I, I believe the highest desire that we can possess is the longing to see God, is to seek Him. Matthew 6 33 says, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first His righteousness and His kingdom. We need to be seeking God first about everything that we do in this church, in our lives. Because when we go and we seek God, we seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And I believe that He's going to be right there with us. Man, we, we see the, the, the great awakening that's going on at Isbury College. 
You can't tell me that those people are not seeking God because they are. I believe the church needs to be seeking God. Can you imagine if all the churches started seeking God and wanting Him to be first and foremost in their life in the church and everything else? And that, that took precedence over everything in your life that was just out to seek God. What does He want in my life? How does He want me to live? What does He want me to do? And that's what we're more worried about than anything else is to seek God. I want to ask you this. When was the last time you felt the urgency to seek God? When was the last, the last time you fell on your knees and sought God for something in your life? As I was putting the sermon together, it made me start thinking, it's been a while since I've hit my knees and sought God that way. We have to have an ur urgency. We have to have a, 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 a sense of helplessness. We have to be seeking God earnestly. We have to have an urgency. It needs to be a priority in our life and in the life of our church. I think that can change a church so drastically if we start putting all the other things off in our life and we just start seeking God first. Satan wants to fill our life with so many things and we're so busy, we're so tired, we can't. Have, we don't have time to seek God because He doesn't want us to. We have to have an urgency. It has to be a priority. And it starts with us. Because if we're not seeking God, our church never will. So to wrap up, you know, the task of our church is crucial. It really is. Yes, Christ came. So we can have a, a, a relationship with, with God. So we have a, uh, so we can have a, an eternity with Him. But as a church, as we're here, right here today, our task is crucial. Our task as a church, and Paul has said it, is to go out and to preach the gospel to everybody. To let people know who Jesus Christ is in our life. We have to be able to go out. We need to Help the help stuff. The, the people who, who 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 don't have what we have. We need to be we need to go out and, and be devoted in love to one another. Here, be encouragers here, and to go out and to help people out there who need our help. We we are called to be unified in Christ. We are called to grow. We're not called to have programs. We're called to be a healthy church. To live and to love God. We need to be spiritual, doctrinal, moral, and have a relation with health. <coughs> we're not here for what the church can do for you. But we're here to serve God. If you were to ask yourself in the mirror, the church needs to do this or needs to do that, you know you're talking to yourself because you are the church. We're not four walls and a, and a roof. We are the church. As we finish up our jet tour through Romans, this has been a great study for me personally. I have been convicted. And I have benefited from this. And I hope that you have too. I hope you benefit from the growing knowledge of the Lord. And apply these things that Paul has given us to your life. To live a better life for God. Paul has written to inform and remind those in Rome and us. The importance of right thinking in regards to what you believe about God. And how that right thinking should affect us in a right living and when our, our thinking is right and our living is right, we're going to be focused on the Lord and we're going to minister to others and we're going to be the church that God wants us to be. Paul has shown us what a God glory, glorifying ministry looks like in our own, and, and, and he can show us how we can have that in our own lives. I believe 
proclaiming the gospel, serving the people, seeking and praying to God, and being personal and caring towards others. I, I think that if we do that as a church and as individuals, we're going to have a God-glorifying ministry. Question R. Question is, are we the church that God calls us to be? If not, we need to start looking at ourselves. Please stand.